This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Set out in the sun with uh, with them today. <laughs> yeah, they were just barking just before. Right, Chloe. <laughs> Chloe, go on. Well, tonight's the last day of the month before the donation night. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, first thing I was going to bring up was another sad... Uh, situation if you if you can't think rationally on it don't comment all right all right let's see so we've got the uh, you know in the, in the daily mail here today now uh, virginia father shoots himself dead outside family home hours after he accidentally left his 18 month old son to die in a hot car when he went to work and forgot to drop him off at daycare so we get this exact same scenario the daycare and a, a dad and I mean it's a really sad story because you can kind of just picture like he and his wife probably just really loved this kid and did everything for him and they based their whole life on that and, his, and he knew that his wife probably loved the child so much that after he did it he realized he just couldn't bear to even see her reaction or even live with himself so he shot himself all right so you know you get all these people out there going oh what an asshole he did it on purpose you know it's this shit happens, everybody, and even to you, the people out there that think it'll never happen to them. Here's, here's what I'll guarantee is that every one of you, at some point, forgot your kid just for a second regarding something, whether or not they were you know, outside, and you go, oh yeah, 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 hold on, hold on a second, or you know, over here, over here. You're not, they're not always in your head because you're a human being and you think about other things. All right, so it, it does happen. This is just one of the, it's a rare thing when somebody uh, their kid dies in a hot car death because something will trigger you to remember early enough. And there are tons and tons of people and parents out there. Like I get emails on the side, don't say who I am, but yeah, there's one time I forgot for my kid for an hour and I was like, oh my God, and then, you know, but nothing happened. You know, so I would say, you know, 99% of the time parents get lucky because they recover soon enough and you know maybe it's not in a hot car or something like that but it does happen and this is just a horrendous situation so a virginia father killed himself after he found his 18 month old son dead in the back seat of an overheated car on tuesday the father who was unidentified was found dead on tuesday in chesterfield with a gunshot wound to the head in the woods behind his home after police received reports he was threatening to harm himself. Officers found the body of a young child inside the home. Uh, this is a terrible tragedy on so many levels. Yeah. Police speculate the father went to work in the morning for three hours and forgot to drop off his son at daycare during an ongoing heat wave. Temperatures in Chesterfield reached a high of 80 degrees Preliminary investigations show the father died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound 
After finding his son lifeless in the car, the Chesterfield police have not released the name of the father and son, uh, officers told Daily Mail. Uh, he was found in the woods behind his home at around noon after police received a tip of where he might be located. The child's family alerted police on Tuesday. So what he did was he actually found his kid in the car, brought it, the child inside, realized what he did, knowing that his kid was dead and he shot himself. You know, he knew that the, his kid wasn't alive. The child's family alerted police on Tuesday morning that the boy had not shown up to daycare. Officers responded to the home located at the 14,100 block of Alden Gate Road after the family received suicidal statements from the father. Upon their arrival, they located the people in the driveway with an open door with an empty child seat in the vehicle. As they made entry into the residence, they found a deceased 18-month-old. The father was found shortly after where the family said he would be. Our hearts go out to the family and friends uh, that are going to deal with this, but we would be remiss in not taking the opportunity for people to take the moment and realize how important it is to obviously check your vehicles. Right, like, but <laughs> that doesn't help anybody. You know, see, here's the thing, everybody. But these guys, they, they don't get because they're not aware of how it works. It doesn't matter if you tell people, hey, make sure to look in your car. Because when you get distracted, you get distracted. No, Nick, that's not what he was doing, Nick. He just wanted to go outside the house and shoot himself. Let's not pretend that that has any... <laughs> Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? Uh, let's see. So a lot of different kids have died this year. Uh, seven children, including an 18-month-old, have died in the United States after being left in hot cars this year. Uh, Ingram was discovered by his uncle after he took the car to a fast food joint. The boy was in the third row of a Nissan SUV. He died of asphyxiation after temperatures reached as high as 96 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You know, there's just... It sucks, you know. So, you know, there are people that do intentionally leave their kid in the car, and whether they knew they were going to die or not is, you know. I mean, I guess it's relevant in terms of like when they left him in the car, did they, you know, it makes them way more culpable, but um, when they did it on intentionally, like they go into gamble for two hours and leaving their kid in the car did they know that the kid was going to die or were they even aware of that that kind of thing you know I, I would give them much more of a sentence than somebody who just literally forgot you know there that's just something that actually happens yeah there, there is a way to know nick it's just uh why, why go down that route he went outside so he didn't mess up the house well, maybe he just didn't want to blow his brains out right on top of his daughter. You know, maybe, you know, who the hell knows, right? But it's just sort of like, it, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. He killed himself, right? So, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it, maybe it does have something to do with that. Maybe he didn't want to blow his brains out all over his house so his wife or whoever was going to be coming home would, would, wouldn't notice. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. It just doesn't seem really relevant. All right, so anyways, uh, really sad, shitty story. And unfortunately, that's how the story had to, uh, the show had to begin. All right, so then we're going to get right on to the um, Brownstown now. Go back to the, the part where they were about to go over the case right here. Right in this area. Yeah, people like people leave their pets all the time in the cars and you know, just those people are much worse than somebody who just was like distracted, you know, it was something out of the ordinary, and then they leave the kid in the car. You know, like, whoa. Yeah, well, he, he killed himself. That that's what his sense see that thing is is he killed himself. Other parents choose to live with the pain 
their whole lives. Like the guy at Intel, right? Like he absolutely was devastated and they didn't charge him, but he's gonna have to live with the fact of what he did for his entire life. Hey, Kathy Frydenmaker. I don't know, I just don't like the, the you know, judgmental kind of shit on something like that, you know? Apparently death is what he deserves because you don't see the judgment coming out as much when you know, when, when the person lives, it's like, oh my God, what a horrendous person. And then they blow their brains out and all of a sudden you don't see the same level of, uh, like as if he deserved the death penalty or something. I mean, what it shows is how much he probably loved that child and just absolutely devastated, you know, couldn't believe it. Yeah. Ugh. I don't know. It's just one of those topics. <laughs> yeah. You mean, well, yeah, Nick, me, ultimately, you might be right. Like, he didn't want to get his brains and stuff all over the house, right? You know? But why would you want to do that? He probably wanted to have your baby be... Like, he probably laid it out, you know, the child out nicely or whatever, and just freaked out and goes, ah, screw it. He's not going to go shoot himself and get blood all over his baby. I mean, how crazy is that? And maybe he just didn't want to, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe he didn't want to have the family to have to uh, clean up his brains inside the house. Right? Like, that would be double whammy. Instead, there's this, you know, the child in there, and... I don't know, it's just... You know what it is? It's a freaking nightmare is what it is. That's all there is to it. That's a horrendous situation. And I, I can totally see how he was feeling. Just totally devastated, just... You know. And, it, and, it, and he had no malintent whatsoever. He just comes home... I mean, he realizes after he gets home, oh my God, my, ch my kid was in the car that whole time. And the child's dead, and it's completely his fault, his responsibility. You know, it's weird too, because it's like there's no malintent, and there's nothing. He's not a flawed human being either. <laughs> human, our brains work just like that. We get distracted on things. Now, sometimes, you know, most of the time, people remember at the right time or early enough. But I guarantee it, every single person in here has forgot something really important at some point. You know, you just remembered early enough where it didn't make any difference. Now you might go, yeah, it's never happened to me, Greg, because my kids are the most important thing in the world. You know, yeah, it is everybody too, right? I mean, everybody's kids are the most important thing to them. I mean, not every, you know, there's obviously wacko, shitty parents out there. But I'm talking about almost every instance when this happens, the kids are the most important thing in their life. And me, that doesn't mean that there isn't a moment where you're looking at, you're, you're just your mind wanders on something. So are you irresponsible to think about other things when you have a kid? I mean, it's just weird the, the lengths that people want to sort of do mental gymnastics and go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have a child, the only thing you're allowed to do is think about that kid every second of every day, every moment that you're awake. You can never think of anything else. Yet you have to, right? Like you go grocery shopping, you do various things, and there's going to be a moment where some, something might happen. Like let's say you're in a grocery store and there's, a, there's TV monitors up there and all of a sudden, boom, a building gets blown up. And you're like looking at it and you're just like, whoa. And you looked away for about a minute, or like 30 seconds, and then your kid gets abducted. Is that your fault, or is it just the way people work? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, not, very, you're not a reasonable person, Zozo. I'm just telling you, it happens. Some people are less. I know you like to always, I mean, I always wish you would just bow out of these conversations, because it, they're not, it's not a rational way to think. All right, let's see. There also was one here in Ontario, Canada, a school teacher 
forgot to drop her child at daycare after school she found her child dead well there you go another daycare one you know what's weird ban daycares everybody let's start banning daycare because daycare seems to be where every one of these children were supposed to go and if you didn't have daycare anymore uh, the parent would be at home with their kid there you go I mean how many of these cases have there been where the child was supposed to get a to go to daycare yeah people are no I'm just talking about this topic Zozo so you always overreact to everything it's crazy it's ridiculous I'm just saying I'm just saying that you you don't have to be so harsh on these people it's it does happen and it's normal and uh, you know it's not well when I say normal I mean it's a normal um, what do you call it uh, it's like a, a normal mechanism that causes it yeah so ban daycares all right Yeah, people just remember quicker, you know, so. Yeah, there's no malintent, you know, it's obvious. Yeah, I don't, I'm not doing, I don't have phone calls, so. The phone isn't a good, good number. Away from you, me, experience. Kids are easy to get away from you. Huh? I don't know what that means. Oh, come on, Jen. Jeez. I didn't even say to go away. I just said I don't like... When, when, whenever we talk about this topic, she just has this one single-minded way of thinking about it. And it, it's not productive because the, there is a reality that there is a thing called forgotten baby syndrome. And it actually does happen. And you see it happen all the time. And when you, when you sit there and you just keep going, Oh, my God! And you go on and on and on. It doesn't help figure out a way... You know moving forward to make people aware of it right so that that's one of the problems I just said that that topic you know but she tried to make a I don't know make a big deal make a scene by saying oh, I'm not gonna be back well I was just saying I don't want you to you know this time I almost asked her before the show because I sent her the link not to comment on on it because I know where everywhere every time where it goes you know it's the same thing Yeah. See, the thing is, when you in the in the scenario with the forgotten baby syndrome, in the mind of the person, they may have even believed and remembered that they dropped the kid off at daycare because, you know, or they didn't know it at all because they never do daycare. So there's other times too when you do something over and over and over again, you have like a false memory, right? And in this case, uh, what is it? I was texting or distracted driving. Huh? I didn't know, Linda. Linda, how? I don't know. I didn't know. What's wrong with uh, Tina? I don't get to see all the comments in here. Thanks, Billy Julian. Yeah, but, but no, but it doesn't work, Gambler77713. You know why? Because you have to remember to put that item there. 
the thing is, is what you, the only way to do it is to make it where if there's something that your car sends a signal out or there's a, a, a phone call that's made to you every day or your alarm goes off, you check it and it goes off until you say, it says, are you sure? You know, something that uh, warns you to check and remember, okay? Uh, when requiring somebody remember something to remember is a problem, <laughs> okay? Because then you have to remember. Like you put your kid in the car and then you go, oh shit, I forgot. I remember to put the thing on there that is attached to this. You know, maybe a weight sensor that sends a, something, a signal to your phone. I mean, most people never need these things, okay? And it's really rare, but it does happen. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. You can, you know, go down the, the train of how hateful and shitty the parents are all day long, but it's not going to work for me. All right, and yes, everybody knows that they gotta be aware. But when you get distracted, you get distracted and there's no coming back. I mean, there is coming back obviously, but it just depends on how quickly you come back. But there isn't something that goes, don't be distracted now. You're thinking about something, your mind wandered. Oh, okay. Well, you feel better, Tina? Yeah. Yeah, now they walk there in the seat behind, so you, you don't really... Hey, thank you very much, Velvet Army. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know uh, that she was getting hand surgery. Is she up in the chat somewhere? I didn't see her. Yeah. No, oh, she can't time. Okay. All right. Anyways, I wasn't trying to pick on on Zozo, but she always has such a negative look on these situations. So, you know, she just overreacted there. Obviously, I, I didn't say anything. I just said I wish you wouldn't respond. Talk about this one because. Like, especially if you're a computer programmer type, as soon as you got out of that car, you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, you run into there and you start doing code and then you, you, your mind is a million miles away at that moment, okay? And you're not going to be coming back in your head, right? Hey, thank you guys so much. Allie Kate, Cammy. Carry, very cool. All right, well, I got so much stuff I got to go over tonight, so see if we can do it. Well, hope you're doing good out there, Tina. Didn't even know you were having surgery or anything like that. Surgery sucks, I can tell you that. You know what's weird is that topic always seems to just create issues, you know? It's just, uh, it's weird, not sure why. I mean, I know in the in the best world, everybody would remember everything all the time. Uh, but just realize the same thing can happen to any one of you, even if you think you're the greatest mom in, on the planet. It could happen to you. You know, and that's the thing is and when it does, you'll say, man, I even knew about it. I didn't think this would ever, you know, and it just it's horrible. They all say the same thing.
Yeah. All right. So here we go. Why don't you get onto the? Uh, says the. Yeah, so here he goes. It says, the remains found in the cabin. So let, let's go back up. This is the part on the Brownstown. Yeah, hold on a second. Okay. So on that topic we were just talking about, my whole goal is... Instead of judging the parents, I want people to be aware that that can happen to anybody. Okay? So just be aware of it. All right? Don't be, you know, like judgmental. Because as soon as you're judgmental, that's when it can strike. Because then you're not looking out for it. Oh, shit, that'll never happen to me. Because I'm, you know, like really think about it. All right? All right, so I'm going to go to the Brownstown case right now. After closely reading the state police reports and witness statements several times, I have put the timeline together from all individuals mentioned in the report or from their own statements. This is the case where the three guys, there was three boys that all died in a, uh, what is it, in a uh, vehicle, like, not a vehicle, in a cabin with um, railroad ties and everything like that. And their railroad ties, like, I think it was, was it creatine? What's the name of that shit? The creosote or something that had the oil on it and everything like that. Uh, the remains found in the cabin were buried at Fairview Cemetery in Brownstown, Indiana. And let's see, and they have shown interest in exhuming the remains for DNA testing to positively prove who the remains belong to. Let's see, uh, let's see. it's possible that the partial, partial remains of Autry, Robinson, and Sewell were located and put into the same or different caskets. It's also possible Sewell's remains were scattered in the ash when the fire department put the fire out. So yeah, I mean he was burned pretty, you know, the whole cabin was in, people were, everything was incinerated in there. So I guess that's possible. Scattered, so it was, uh, it's also possible Sewell's remains were scattered in the ash when the fire department put the fire out on the morning of December 18, 1971. There could be also more of Robinson and Autry's remains that were scattered by the water pressure used to put the fire out. It seems the only way to know this for certain is to exhume the remains for DNA testing or to do a very detailed search of the cabin site for anything that was left behind. I believe it's possible to locate more remains at the site. While I was there, while I was there with uh, the neighbor, I guess, maybe it's the landowner, and I located a burnt piece of wood that was still on the topsoil of the ground. The wood was very light from being charred and burnt, but was still visible and laying on top of the ground. I also believe it wouldn't have been impossible for all remains to have been found in the time that was spent searching for the bodies. So they need to get like forensic anthropologists out there. Let's see. Uh, I also believe it wouldn't have been impossible. Okay, the report refers to the scene being cleared of investigators at noon on December 18th. The report also reflects the fire wasn't put out until 9.30 a.m. on December 18th. So they only searched for like three hours, which had only given the investigators two and a half hours to look for the remains of the victims. The report also mentions it wasn't until 2 p.m. 
On December 18, 1971, they learned that Sewell was missing. During the investigation, I have found some things that don't make sense, but I understand it was over 50 years ago and things were done a lot differently than they are today. In no way am I placing blame on any person, family member, or department. I'm simply acknowledging the fact of the information I have been given as I believe it's important in solving what really happened on December 18th, 1971. You know, so this is 51 years ago. Uh, we covered it in January. And I think we talked about it, uh, you know, before too, but we talked about it in January and then the um, sheriff actually contacted me and was saying, wow, that was cool. You found a lot of stuff that I didn't have like in the newspapers. I, I don't remember if I sent them all the PDF files or not. But The fire was discovered and reported at 8.20 a.m. December 18, 1971. The state police received a call from the Jackson County Sheriff's Department at 8.35 a.m. Fifteen minutes later, requested assistance. The report advises that state police were told at the time a child had burned to death. Later, the report advises the fire wasn't put out until 9.30 a.m., and it was at that time they determined there were at least two bodies and possibly more in the remains. The same report then states at the time of the report was written they believed only two subjects were in the fire. The fire wasn't put out until 9.30 a.m. on December 18, 1971. All investigating personals, personnel maybe, uh, were completed. I'm not sure. All investigating personals were completed and left the scene at 12 p.m., which concluded the search for the bodies was only two and a half hours or less. I have spoken with a funeral home director who advised he performed around 600 cremations a year I learned the average cremation takes about three hours in a controlled environment at 1,650 degrees. That's interesting. If the cabin fire was burning with that much heat and intensity, I don't see it being possible to do a thorough search for all the remains in two and a half hours. And remember how it just burned and burned all night long, like somebody was driving by and then it was still burning? It was almost like smoldering by the time police got, I mean the fire department got there. Well, good, good for you. You can poop at my house. I don't care. <laughs> you know? And hey, by the way, just get out of here. <clears throat> All right. Investigators advised only two bodies were found after they learned Jerry Autry wasn't at home and was supposed to have spent the night with Stanley Robeson. So, you know, they only got two bodies, but there were three in there. One report refers to two high school class rings found in the remains. This was the only means of identification for the bodies. That report is the only report to mention two rings, the autopsy report from Dr. Merritt Alcorn advises one set of remains were obviously identified by a class ring as Jerry Autry, and the second set of remains is thought to be the remains of Stanley Robeson. There is no mention of Stanley Robeson's ring being used to identify him. There is a documented record of seized or recovered property form from ISP for only one class ring. It's documented as one class ring, 1972 Brownstown blue setting, Jerry Autry's mother, Louis, uh, Louise Autry, requested ISP release the ring to her, and it was done so by ISP on March 27, 1974. The Robinsons never received a ring from ISP, and there's no evidence remaining in their evidence storage or any record of the Robinsons' ring being collected. Hmm. So they really only have one ring. So how did they know that the other body was, you know, not Sewell? They were all seen just after 2 a.m. on December 18th, leaving the American Legion Hall of Brownstown. The five boys obtained food and alcohol beverages and told someone they were uh, taking it to the cabin. They both stated all five of them went back to the cabin after leaving the American Legion. 
uh, leaves before I think there's two other kids there you know not the three that are either missing or dead but there's two other kids so like kid number one leaves before kid number two and arrives home at 2 30 a.m. Right arrival time at home was provided by his parents who waited who were waiting up for him and then let's see something state in the fire marshal hearing on it's hard to read this with all these redacted names it's kind of you know it's not even needed really it took him about three minutes to drive home from the cabin so so and so would have left the cabin around 2:25 a.m. and um, so what there's another one who's the second person is the last to leave the cabin and states in the fire marshal on 12 21 1971 he left at around 3 30 a.m. also states he didn't see any fire other than the fire in the stove at the cabin before leaving. One report advises it's believed the fire smoldered for more than an hour. The fire flames are seen by a motorist on SR-135 at around 3.50, approximately 20 minutes after Hubbard stated he left. So when Hubbard leaves, so I guess that name should have been redacted, right? So that must have been Hubbard, like that's Hubbard, that's Hubbard, that's Hubbard, Hubbard. So so and so leaves before Hubbard and arrives home at 2:30. Hubbard is the last to leave the cabin and states in the fire marshal hearing he left at around 3:30. Hubbard also states he didn't see any fire other than the fire in the stove at, at the cabin before leaving. One report advises it's believed the fire smoldered for more than an hour. The fire flames are seen by a motorist on SR-135 around 3.50. Uh, so, I, let's see. Somebody handed Stanley Robeson the lantern before leaving. So, Hubbard's handed Stanley Robeson the lantern before leaving. He also mentions the lantern was sitting above the couch. The reports indicate Stanley Robeson put the lantern on his bed and Autry and Robeson were watching the lantern when it caught fire. How, how does anybody know this? A report also indicates Autry and Robeson had backed themselves into the corner of the cabin. Wait, how, who, where is this coming from? Also mentions the lantern was sitting above the couch. The reports indicate, so this is just the reports indicate, like that's their theory that Stanley Robeson put the lantern on his bed and Autry, or I don't know what reports they're talking about. Was that a report of an interview? And Autry and Robeson were watching the lantern when it caught fire. So that sounds like somebody were looking at them. A report also indicates Autry and Robeson, I mean, how would you know that somebody was looking at the lantern before it caught fire unless you got that from a report of the an actual witness here? So does this, is this person watching the, it, the fire start? Hmm. So Hubbard handed Stan, uh, hmm, handed Stanley Robeson the lantern before leaving. So let's say Hubbard handed Stanley Robeson the lantern before leaving. And then some other person also mentions the lantern was sitting above the couch. And it says the report indicates Stanley Robeson put the lantern on his bed and Autry and Robeson were watching the lantern when it caught fire. How do you know that they were watching the lantern? I mean, that sounds like something that somebody would have seen. A report also indicates Autry and Robeson had backed themselves into the corner of the cabin before burning. Then the report advises Autry and Robeson died from asphyxiation long before being uh, in danger, uh, in danger of the fire. The coroner's verdict advises act accidental death due to complete incineration and smoke inhalation. Mike Sewell was believed to be on the couch in the cabin, asleep when the fire started. A report indicates Mike Sewell was awakened after the fire smoldered for one hour and crept down to a plastic container containing gas that caused it to ignite. So this is what their theory is. I don't understand how they could know that they were both sitting there looking at it. 
If you're just coming up with a report, that's just weird, you know. The cabin was 9 by 15 and three boys were believed to have been in the cabin when the fire smoldered for one hour and gas container ignited. However, the reports indicated that the, uh, only Autry and Robis, Robeson died from the smoke inhalation before being in danger of the fire. It should also be noted Mike Sewell reportedly had a lung breathing problem and didn't like to smoke marijuana because of it. Drugs, LSD, and marijuana were mentioned, statements, and in the report, all the boys were believed to be high on drugs. The drugs are referenced as causing Autry and Robeson to not realize they were in danger. The autopsy report doesn't mention anything about teeth being present during the autopsy, but Victor Burkholder was the Jackson County coroner at the time, is quoted in a newspaper article saying four or five teeth were located. As of May 9th, 2022, there are still few people I'd like to talk to, including the Sewell family. Um, I'd like to see if the Sewells would be willing to submit DNA for testing, if any other remains are eventually located, or if the remains were buried or exhumed. <laughs> yeah, so they got to do like an anthropological uh, dig almost here. I don't have a definite answer or opinion of what happened the night of December 18, 1971, but I do believe more can be done to find out. I don't believe the cabin fire could have totally incinerated one body and not the other two, but at the same time, I don't believe authorities were looking for three bodies due to Sewell not being reported missing until investigators left the scene of the cabin. I also believe if four or five teeth were found, more teeth could be could have been overlooked in the search. I believe the pressure from the fire hose used by the fire department could have spread things out at the scene, making it appear there was not another body where the couch would have been located. I plan to reach out to the fire marshal for some questions that I have about the fire. A couple of the questions I have are, could the 9 by 15 cabin burn at a temperature hot enough to totally incinerate one, uh, but not the other? Is it possible that two subjects died from smoke inhalation and one subject survived in such a small contained structure? I received a text message from <clears throat> something Autry over the weekend, May 20th, 2022, advised her. Autry located Jerry's class ring <clears throat> in the ring and advised she would bring it to me to photograph and to have for a planned meeting on Monday the 23rd. The ring is in very good condition. 1972 is visible on both sides and an Indian brave head is visible on the side. The other side of the ring is also intact. There is a blue colored stone on top that is also good condition with little to no damage. The inside of the ring did not have or did have some blacken, blackening but the words Justin 10K are visible. I'm assuming the 10K stands for gold. Yeah. Let's see, is there anything else in here? I think they're just talking about why they need to get the exhumation here. I'm not going to go through all this. I got a lot of stuff to go through. Doesn't seem like it's like the day's events. I'd like to have a narr narrative. Like we already have that from the news articles and so forth. All right, anyways. Oh, that's the company? Okay. Yeah? Is that a, is that a known jewelry company, Dana? I don't know.
All right. Anyways, that was that was probably pretty boring for you guys. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna get on to something else. So first one we're going to do is Ricky uh, Herid, Herridge, I think it's like Herridge maybe, H-E-R-R-I-A-G-E, -R -R -E. right? So that's a picture of him right there. Man held in rape case. A suspect was in custody in connection with the August 18th rape of a 19-year-old woman and police were searching for three other men involved in the attack. All right, so this this is what... Okay, let me, let me do this in a different order here, okay? So I'm going to go to uh, 1987, all right? So, so here's 1987. Henderson County authorities are investigating as homicide, the death of a 29-year-old Athens man whose body was found under a bridge on Old Malakoff Highway, Chief Deputy uh, Marine Paget said Monday. The body of Ricky Jean Herridge was found at about four to was found about four to five miles west of Athens off State Highway 31 by a woman and a child as the two were picking up cans along the roadway. So I actually think that, uh, here, let me get to the folder here. God, there it is. Hmm. Yeah, so I think this is act. This is might be it right here. So I mean, here's Highway 31. They said off of Highway 31, but on Old um, let's see Malakoff Highway. And I'm kind of thinking that that's what this road is right here, because it also said it was over a bridge that went over a specific creek. And then the creek is this creek, Walnut Creek right here. And then right here is this little, looks like a, I don't know if that's a bridge or, let me, let me turn off roads here really quick. Yeah, it's hard to say, but there's a creek obviously that goes underneath the road. Or, you know, it could be right there actually. That looks even better. Let me think. Is that still Walnut Creek though? And there's a bridge right there. Also, one here, and it's got to be still Walnut Creek. Yeah, that is still Walnut Creek. Okay, good. So let me move that up a little bit. So that might be the bridge right there. Because Walnut Creek doesn't go anywhere near Highway 31, but it is off of Highway 31. And then maybe, heck, maybe that was the old highway right there. And maybe, is there a street view here? No. There's a bridge right there too, so maybe it could either be one of these two. And then maybe that highway at one point, you know, you, you would take it and it would come up here or something and then it would go over to Malakoff. I don't really know for sure, for certain, but Huh? Hello, I know that he knows you were going to be not sure he knows that you have. I don't know what that means, Amber, what you just wrote right there. Oh, um, yeah, well, I knew that you were going to exhume him. Uh, I think I knew that. I think you said that, that he was exhumed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just reading what you guys... You know, that was probably what you used to convince people to exhume, right? But uh, what would be cool is if you guys came up with a really good timeline 
like a new update to a timeline that's better than all the articles that are out there. You know, like something that really put it all together. No, I do. I do know that you 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 told me that you you got the ex exhumation. I don't think I said it on the show, but you told me that a while ago. Didn't you send me an email that said that you ex you're exhuming them or you exhumed them? So it's like eight, seven or eight days ago. <clears throat> well, it's good. Is there a significant amount of bone in there? Or like, or is there just barely anything in each casket? Or was there more than you were thinking? Yeah, you guys should put out a, a better narrative of the timeline. I think I sent you a ton of my, all the newspaper articles that we had back when you contacted me a few months back. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Right, so there, here's a, uh, so in this case, there's this individual named um, Ricky Jean Herridge was found about four to five miles west of Athens off State Highway 31 by a woman and child as the two were picking up cans along the roadway around 10 or around 1.30 p.m. Sunday. Uh, he had been shot once in the chest with an undetermined caliber. Herridge was pronounced dead by Precinct 4 Justice of the Peace, Sue Terrence. So what, I, what happened on this one was I was at that moment I was like, you know, I just typed in his name, you know, to, to do a search for, uh, you know, Ricky Herridge, which probably isn't very common, right? Like Ricky and then H-E-R-R-I-A-G-E -E on newspapers.com in... I think it's it's Texas, Athens, you know, just Texas, and around that time, I think I put in like 1980 to to 87, and when I did that, it came up with this. So 1981. So he was killed in 87, right? So and then I saw his name in this article. A suspect was in custody in connection with the August 18th rape of a 19-year-old woman, and police were searching for three other men involved in the attack, the Tyler Courier Times-Telegraph learned Saturday. Athens Municipal Judge Matt Livingston confirmed he had, a, he had arraigned and set $3,000 bond for one of the suspects in the case, but Livingston, speaking from his Athens residence, could not recall the name of the suspect. The man was arrested by Athens Police Friday and brought before Livingston uh, before Livingston between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Friday. Sources close to the investigation said warrants for three other men had been obtained by Athens Police, but as late as Saturday, none had been arrested. The rape happened early Tuesday, August 18th, when the victim had returned to Athens to visit friends and her parents. The woman had moved to Round Rock recently. The police were summoned about 4 a.m. Tuesday by the victim's father. When the woman reached his Cay uh, Cayuga Drive home, the victim told police she had been with a male friend at Lake Athens earlier, and while there, a white pickup containing four men appeared and one of the men fired a gun. The couple left the lake Athens area and returned to the victim's car. Her companion left her and she was getting into her car. The four men in the truck appeared and forced her to leave the area with them. The attack took place on a secluded dirt road, the victim said, 
was off East Clinton Street. I right, see it was raped right on the street right here, East Clinton Street. Not sure where the dirt road is, but that was that was an article from the 23rd. And then we go to this article that didn't name anybody, but this one says a suspect identified as Gene Wilson was out on bond Sunday um, after being arrested in connection with the August 18th rape of a 19-year-old woman. Henderson County Chief Deputy Marion Marshall said one suspect was charged with the incident and three were being detained by Athens police in regards to the case. Uh, the rape was reported Tuesday, August 18th, after a 19-year-old woman told her father she had been forced to leave with four men in a white pickup truck. All right. When we get to this one, this one has names in it. Police continued their search Monday for the fourth man in connection with this week's rape. Police Chief Dave Harris said three of the suspects in the case have been arrested and freed after posting $3,000 bond, each on charges of aggravated sexual assault. Ricky Harrich, 23, and Keith Dodd, 20. So look at that. <laughs> so right there, that's one of the suspects here. Uh, Ricky Harrich, right there, 23, and Keith Dodd, 20, both of Athens, were released from Henderson County Jail on the bonds after having been arraigned. So I, but here's the thing. So. These two guys and two others were, uh, you know, at least being held or they were, you know, given bond on charges of rape of a woman. And then we find out, you know, that he gets killed in 1987. So I thought to myself, could this be some sort of uh, like a revenge killing? You know, because it doesn't look like their names are in the paper ever again. Like they just got away with it, perhaps. Something like that, right? Then you look at 1981, the same year. And it says right here that Dodd, so look how crazy this is. So that guy's name is Keith Dodd right here, right? Keith Dodd and he's 20. And this is in Athens. So then they're right here in the paper, MK Dodd. So services for Monty Keith Dodd. I'm pretty sure that's the same Dodd, 20. You know, it's like you just didn't put Monty. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's possible it's a different one, but it's in the same little town. You know, Athens, Texas. You know, Monty Keith Dodd, 20. Athens are set for uh, 2 p.m. Sunday at Carroll and Lair Memor uh, Mem Memory Chapel with the Reverend. So he died in a car accident, but what if that wasn't really, you know, what if it was sort of an intentional deal? Because now you've got two people. I mean, I was actually shocked out of my mind to... Hey, thank you very much, Adam Nicholson. The sheriff. <laughs> yeah. <clears> that <throat> yeah, was good to see you in your, in your video. Thank you very much. So what do you guys think of that? Do you think that's just total coincidence right there? Or... Yeah, so he got injuries received in an automobile accident. Now, he could just be like some weirdo, but, you know, like just reckless kid. He's only 20. <clears throat> but, man, that's literally just, you know, three or four months after the rape. And then, you know, it did take six years later. It's pretty weird, though, right? All right, then we're going to go to like 2015. Let's see if they mention anything like that in here. Yeah, I mean, one of them is a car accident. And the other one's shot. But, uh, this story is part of a collaborative project, cold case in University of North Florida. Ricky Harridge was the ultimate big brother to his family. Virginia Culpepper, Ricky... His younger sister still remembers the time he stood up to a friend of his for cussing in front of her, even though they were all adults. He always tried to be the protector, the big brother, for all his family and his siblings. Ricky was a protective big brother, but also a father to his two kids. Virginia remembers Ricky 
loving his little family, which included his uh, daughter and stepson. On March 7, 1987, that little family lost a big part when Ricky never came home from Saturday night out. Uh, he was found the next morning. More than three decades later, his murder has still not been solved. Ricky worked as a carpenter to make a living, but was actively trying to get a higher education. Although he had dropped out of high school in his junior year, he later received his GED and was recommended by a program to go to college. Virginia says he was starting to look into different universities. Uh, he was street smart and was book smart, she said. You don't find many that are both. Ricky enjoyed playing cards with friends and going out to clubs on the weekend in his free time. In the small town of Athens, Texas, everybody knew everybody. Two weeks before his murder, Ricky was jumped by five guys and one woman. Well, that's interesting, right? <laughs> Doesn't that sound, uh, you know, I mean, why would there be a woman in there? Wouldn't that be interesting? If that woman was part of what happened six years prior. Two weeks before his murder, Ricky was jumped by five guys and one woman. Virginia says, that the men were friends of a woman from Ricky's past. Ah, jeez. And they beat him until he was so sore to go to work, she recalled. It is unclear whether his murder was connected to this earlier incident. I don't know, that sounds likely. Days later, he was shot multiple times in his hometown of Athens after a night out at a club his lifeless body was thrown off the County Road 1500. God, did I get that right? That seems right. County 1500 Bridge. I think I might have had it right the first time. Let me turn the roads back on. Yeah. Well, that is the one. Yeah, County Road 1500. That's where we just shifted it to. So it's probably this one right there. Awesome. Now he was 29 years old. To this day, the police have no information on who killed him or who he was with beforehand. Uh, we don't know who, what, when, where, or why. I wonder if the police have ever put together that there was an incident six years before. You know, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, because that should be a big clue, you know, something that would be like, hmm, you know, maybe there was somebody that had a perceived wrong and they knew these guys got away with it for years. And, you know, that's a pretty big motive. Virginia says that she and her mother try to avoid talking about Ricky's murder in front of her two other brothers. Ricky's little family has grown, grown a lot in the years since his death. Uh, he would now have four grandkids, five step-grandkids, and a great-grandson. Right. Thirty-two years is a long time to not know why your loved one is no longer with you and who to blame. But that's exactly how long an Athens family has lived without closure for the death of their son. And despite the circumstances surrounding the case, Sour Ladarian Cole tells us Henderson County authorities and the family haven't given up on solving this cold case. Ricky Harris was only 29 when he was found murdered in Athens in 1987 after being seen outside a local restaurant. His case is one of 52,402 homicides reported in Texas between 1980 and 2008. And according to the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, Harris's murder is among the nearly 30% of the cases to go unsolved. I still feel like whoever killed him is here. I strongly feel that. For three decades, Annette Harridge has lived a parent's nightmare, confidently holding call, on to a gut feeling that, that her son's killer has walked freely among she and her family. And I wanted to go out to where he was. That's about the strongest motive but you could get. There were 
they didn't think I should go. It was really a hard, hard time. The body of 29-year-old Ricky Herridge, her oldest child, was discovered the morning of March 8, 1987, in Athens. He was shot, and that's how he was deceased. It appeared that uh, he was, his body was, was dumped uh, there on Monkey Bridge Road. They did a lot of interviews back in 87. They, they worked the case. It never turned up anything. We had a amateur investigator on the case, and I really didn't feel like that the investigation took off like right it there. should have. Yeah. <laughs> they were right on that one. And I still don't. Back then, DNA wasn't really thought of that much. There wasn't a lot of preservation. Amateur investigation. Monkey Bridge Road. They did a lot of interviews back in 87. They, they worked it. That, uh, he was, his body was, was dumped uh, there on Monkey Bridge Road. They did a lot of interviews back in 87. They, they worked the case, uh, never turned up anything. We had a amateur investigator on the case, and I really didn't feel like that the investigation took off like it should have, and I still don't. Back then, DNA wasn't really thought of that much. There wasn't a lot of preservation with DNA. That's a little bit of a detriment to us because we can't go back and, and research some of the DNA aspects of it. Henderson County investigator Jerry Corder was assigned this case in 2016. It's been a challenge. Once you get a cold case like this, you basically start from scratch. The longer you go, the tougher it is because a lot of your witnesses, possible suspects, end up dying. In addition to Ricky's murder, Quarter says the department is still seeking answers in two other cold cases. The 2009 missing persons case of 15 year old Heather Cannon, as well as information in the infamous 1993 unsolved murder of socialite Shelley Watkins. In a case like this, in an agency our size, it's difficult to dedicate one person to do cold cases only. So having the family out there beating the bushes a lot of times makes it, it keeps it relevant. And that's exactly what Annette and her daughter <laughs> Virginia have Culpepper that. have yes. set out to do, yeah. including speaking to witnesses. If your son got murdered, I do believe she reminds any me of woman my mom. would looks very do everything she could to find my out what happened younger. to him. There's still some people some out, out there that I would like for them to talk to. It's something that is on your mind 24-7. It don't go away. You have to work, you have to smile, you have to live, but it's there and it doesn't go away. Two weeks prior to Ricky's murder, his sister and mother say something happened that they believe may have led to his death. He was in a fight in Caney City. There was five guys jumped on him. Ricky had told his ex-wife that, you know, it was not fair fight and he would see each one of them one-on-one -on -one and he would come out ahead. Also, that was his ex-wife. That wasn't the woman he raped. We've re-polygraphed some people that whose names keep resurfacing. Some we've been able to clear. Or we don't know if he raped. But we're still anybody. looking he, into several names. He was accused. Though of. no suspects have been named, the family is still hopeful for answers. A Crime Stoppers reward now sits at sixteen thousand five hundred dollars, with more than a. See each one of them one on one, and he would come out ahead. We've re-polygraphed some people that thing. whose names the keep resurfacing. Some we've been able to clear, but we're still looking into several names. Though no suspects have been named, the family. So the road goes in curves. So let's see which where that is exactly. Is it that one? Yeah, it almost feels like she's standing. She's on this one, like we had originally. Right here. And the reason I think that, or unless you know, maybe they have it wrong or whatever. Like they're not at the right bridge, but. It, you can see that, you know, it's a little deeper there, and also the road curves like that, and that's exactly what it does right here. And there's even trees right there, and it looks like, uh, you know, it's hard to absolutely make it out 100%, but. Emily is still hopeful for answers. Okay, now that one doesn't look like the right one. So let's just look at that again. Because there should be a road right here. Let me look at that again. And it's so close. Let me turn off the... Uh, 
the roads. So maybe it is this one. Or could it be that one? And it's just sort of the camera. I think that might be it. So I think the, the second one was right. That actually makes more sense. <laughs> it's just kind of a low camera, so the turn of the road looks closer behind them. But it's actually a ways back. And then you can see the fields and everything. Off to the left right here, that makes sense. And then the road just goes, it does, because in this one, there should be another road that goes like that. And that's not there, it just kind of turns and goes around. So that would probably be uh, this one, like that. And they're standing right on the edge of this bridge here, looking over. And the camera's kind of down low, so that turn looks closer. All right, anyways, that's it for that. Records show the 29-year-old's body was located around 1 p.m. March 8, 1987. He appeared to be found thrown on a bridge on County Road 1500, and that actually matches the second, the other bridge that we have. Either early that morning or late night, uh, Charlie Fields was sheriff. Then uh, Slick Alfred was who succeeded him and served three terms as a Texas Ranger. In 2015, Herod's sister started a website about the killing where she would post tidbits of information about the case. That year, the organization called Project Cold Case was formed to remind the public about Herod's case and others like it. I mean, they have thousands on there. I actually use that a lot. They just give you like a little breakdown. I just usually use it to get the name and the state. Culpepper said, let's see, Culpepper continues to refresh the story in hopes that it'll stir up some memory. Culpepper said her brother was jumped and beaten by five men and a woman two weeks before his lifeless body was discovered. She doesn't know if the two inc incidents are related and law enforcement has not been able to establish a link. Herridge left behind a daughter and stepson at the time of, the, of his death. Many family members and friends still cling to the hope that information will be discovered to reveal the killer. Hmm, well, I'm gonna have to uh, give that one a call. A Crime Stoppers reward now sits at $16,500, with more than a half of that coming from friends and family. Of course, they'll say, well, what if whoever killed him is dead? You know, <laughs> I'm not going there. If they have any kind of a heart, a mind, a conscience, if they ever lived losing a loved one, then I'm praying, and if, if they're out there and they can hear me now, I'm praying they come forth. That family deserves answers, and you know, I, I really want us to be able to give them answers. Now, Cole Pepper tells me she's hopeful answers will come while her mother is still alive. Unfortunately, her and Ricky's father has since passed away. Sheriff Hill House tells me evidence from this case will be sent to a forensics lab in California where new DNA technology is currently being used to analyze one of the department's other cold cases. He says his department will continue to aggressively work Ricky's murder until they're able to say case closed. In studio, Ladarian Cole, CBS 19. All right, thank you, Ladaria. And Ricky Herridge's case was recently presented to the Sheriff's Association of Texas cold case review team for even further review. Now, if you have any information regarding this cold case, call Crime Stoppers or the Henderson County Sheriff's Office. Thank you, Jessica Schubach. I'm definitely going to call in on that because I actually think... Fifth County, however, is uh, not under a burn. But that has much well, more a likelihood, maybe. I mean, I don't know much more because there was something so recently within two weeks that that might be sort of like you know i don't know i don't know who those people are it sounded like it was the ex-wife though the way it was described in one of the articles like it was the ex-wife and he said well i'll just fight all of you individually you know you know so that that's what that sounds like but you know if there was some 
uh, somebody that would kill would be something like in the 1981 if somebody I don't know how that all played out so I'm just basing it on the fact that he was arrested and had bail and everything and but it was no more reporting on it so it could have turned out when it was just completely bogus and you know and it has nothing to do with anything okay but if it does and if it's a real thing and it just kind of got washed under the rug and nobody got charged you could see somebody getting really angry at some point hey thanks Ozzy Trisha Good eye, mind again. Any noise things, and that's me all your score, am I? <laughs> no, it wasn't very good. I'm, I suck at it. So, and thank you, Brenda R. Appreciate it. All right, so what do you guys think about that story right there? I mean, it wouldn't hurt, right, to call in. I'm gonna call tomorrow and let them know. You know. I mean. It, You'd think they'd be aware of it, but if it was some, if it was a charge that just kind of went away or something, and it got wasn't even on people's records, then it wouldn't show up. I wouldn't think. I don't know if it gets expunged or whatever, but yeah. So I'll I'll do that tomorrow. I'll let you know what they say. Okay, so let me. Go, I'm gonna go use the uh, restroom really quick. <laughs> let me get you. Well, the dogs aren't even around, so I'll be back in just a second. We got two more interesting ones. Oh, there we go. Hey, where's the... Uh... Well, I just saw Chloe run back in, but she didn't jump up on there. Oh, you want the... Okay, I'll let you play it. I'll play it just for a sec. I always get people complaining about it. I don't like that song, Gray. Well, there you go. There's some groovy tunes for you for a second.
Thanks, Donna and Scott, for PayPal. I hate this thing though, it's weird. I like it. There, there's that music. That's my, uh, I figured out what that is. It's actually the, uh, the the board that pops out like that sometimes. So I do have a new USB cable coming in to solve that. If that doesn't work, I'll just I might might be time for a new one. Because the driver's in there, it's correct. And it doesn't do that when I don't have the when it's not plugged in. The, the soundboard. The regular driver for the computer doesn't do that, so, you know, the real tech one. All right, well, there you go, everybody. <laughs> it's switching off right now. <laughs> yeah. All right, now this one is Linda Reyes Geddes, maybe, G-E-D-D-E-S. I don't really know for sure how to pronounce it, but yeah, it was a Jane Doe case uh, from a while ago, which was, uh, so here, let me, I went back and found the original, well, maybe we could do this one last because uh, there's a spot that I can't find. It'd be kind of fun to kind of keep, you know, go around and look together. Maybe find it. I don't know. So we're going to do uh, Karen Marchioni first. And I know Morph did it. It looks like he did an episode on like murder in my family or something. Or maybe it was actually criminology or something. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> but uh, here is this case. This is out of Boston or out of Massachusetts again. And, you know, she went missing on the 8th. I couldn't find any articles before this, but it looked like they'd already been talking about it, for sure. Hey, thanks, Jan Harrell. On Karen Mar Marchioni's 41st birthday, two days before she was murdered, her parents threw a large party at the family home on Mill Street, uh, Carol Marcioni cooked her daughter's favorite vegetarian dishes, eggplant, uh, parmigiana, and spinach lasagna, <laughs> I guess. Uh, the next day, Carol Marcioni and her other daughter delivered birthday gifts to Karen's Nelson Street house. That was the last time they saw her alive. The next day, October 8th, Carol Marcioni Got a call from the state police at about 2 p.m. informing her that Karen had been killed. Karen was the most uh, non-violent person and had been that way since the day she was born. Carol Marcioni said, um, let's see, and it says, who would do this? Some crazy person, I guess? I don't think Karen's ever hurt anyone in her life. Family members say they don't know who would have wanted to kill Karen. So far, the murder... Uh, frame, let's see, Framingham first since July 2000 has stumped state police and the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. No suspects have been arrested. They're, they're asking about anyone and everybody that uh, Karen's ever known, said her former husband, Stephen Case, who has custody of their daughter and remained on friendly terms with Marcioni and her family. 
On October 8th, Marcioni made a 911 call. So this gets pretty crazy. Oh, by the way, Nick, if you're out there, I don't know if I, you know, maybe I just misread what you were writing earlier. I know everybody has their own thoughts on that other, the hot car topics, you know. But I, you know, even, you know, I get sort of heated up <laughs> during those things. <laughs> okay, so, anyways, I apologize if, you know, I just get that topic is one that really bothers me a lot. And not because, you know, I, I feel horrible for the kids and everything like that, but it really bothers me because of the perception that society, a lot, a lot of people have in society that aren't aware of the actual, you know, what's going on, you know. So, anyways. I apologize for, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a human being just like everybody else. So sometimes I overreact to certain things and Zozo, you too, you know, I don't mean, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, everybody has their, their opinions out there. Sometimes I just get really like on certain topics that just, man, it's hard for me to accept a different one. But man, I mean, I think a lot of people are just kind of like that, right? Yeah. It's a shitty... Man, I just... I can't even imagine doing something like that. I mean, I'd feel almost like that if it was a dog, you know? Like if... <laughs> like if I somehow took Chloe to... Uh, go get groomed or something. And then I thought, you know what? Let me just go pick up something really quick. And I run in and I just kind of lose track of time. And I start, like... Uh, looking around at various things and talking to salespeople, and, and then uh, you get back out there an hour and the dog died or something in a hot car, you'd probably just absolutely like just want to, you know, punch yourself in the face and just <laughs> I don't know, man. And I, I don't, I can't, I mean, I can't, I think it, with a child, it'd be a thousand times worse, though, you know. Somebody that was going to live way past your time and there's no expectation of you living, you know, like children aren't supposed to die before their parents. Yeah, don't even know what that means, Leah, but. <clears throat> That's all right. All right, so let me get back onto this. So this is the crazy part. Now we're getting into what happened here. So on October 8th, Marcioni, that this lady right here, she's like a, kind of a I don't know, granola person. I'm not sure exactly how you describe her, but, uh, you know, Amish Day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. On October 8th, Marcioni made 911 call from her home at 14 Nelson Street. So I do have that. I actually looked her up on Ben Verified. I didn't know it was in the article. So this is her house. I think this is where she was killed, too. I mean, just a really nice house. So on October 8th, Marcioni made a 911 call from her home at 14 Nelson Street in Farmington just before 11 a.m. When police arrived, they found her lying in a pool of blood. And, and she was stabbed multiple times in the face and neck. She was airlifted to the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in Worche, uh, Wor Worcester, where she was pronounced dead at 1 p.m. After her funeral Friday afternoon, family members remembered Marcioni as an animal lover and volunteer who battled addiction and had recently found a haven in the Belmont Church on Later Day Saints, the area of Mormon Church. Marcioni lived around the corner from her former husband and 14-year-old daughter and spent about three nights a week with her child. The last couple of years, she really turned the corner, Case said. She'd been happier than she'd been uh, before. In 1986, Marcioni founded uh, Framingham Animal Shelter, originally keeping the stray animals in her own attic. In recent years, according to her mother, Marcioni couldn't work full time. You know, I wonder if that led to the divorce. I mean, if my wife kept, uh, you know, 17 cats and 42 uh, rabbits and shit up in the attic, 
Probably wouldn't last that long. Ah, uh, that those are uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. Oh, jeez. A 1986 newspaper clipping. Oh, I think I wrote it here. Hold on. In recent years, according to her mother, Marcioni couldn't work full time because she suffered from the chronic joint muscle disorder, fibromyalgia. She volunteered at Countryside Nursing Home and continued working with the front. Let's see, the Framingham Humane Society shelter. In October 2000, Marcioni married uh, Stephen Henderson, 39, who is now in Cambridge jail on domestic violence charges. Oh, boy. Okay, well, now you can see, you know, maybe that's an angle here. So she married in October of 2000. So this happened in like a year later. So in October 2000, uh, married Marcia, married, and then Stephen Henderson, 39, who is now in Cambridge jail on domestic violence charge unrelated to the murder. She met him at Jamboree for recovering addicts, her mother said. They split up a month after they were married, Carol Marcioni said. It was a volatile relationship. So maybe some other person she was with, maybe? Or he was with, like, that he got into the domestic violence situation. Let's see. They split up a month after they were married. Since marrying Henderson last October, Marcioni called police to her home six times. Since marrying Henderson last October. Wow. Marcioni called police to her home six times. Henderson was convicted of two counts of assault and battery for pushing Marcioni over a couch and into a stove on October 29, 2000. After that incident, police responded to four more domestic calls at Marcioni's house this year, and Henderson was convicted of two counts of violating a restraining order. Oh, man. <laughs> How could it not be this guy at this point? On September 7th, Henderson was arrested on charges of violating a restraining order and violating parole. He had been in jail since uh, ever since. Marcioni? Huh, well, if he was in jail at the time, how would he have done that? That's wild. So he's in jail when sh this happens. Wow. Uh, Marcioni, he must have been, right? So on September 7th, Henderson was arrested on charge. So this is just a month before. Uh, you know, so she hasn't even murdered yet. She's murdered a month later. He has been in jail ever since. Wow. Marcioni. <laughs> so it's not him. <laughs> God, that's crazy. Uh, but maybe he's related to it, you know. Marcioni had also faced legal problems and was scheduled to go on trial November 30th on a charge of falsifying a prescription for the painkiller Phycoprofen at the Ashland Osco drugstore in May. Friends and family, including Henderson, who was given permission to leave jail and go to the funeral home when other family members weren't there, lined up for hours at a Thursday evening wake uh, uh, later and worked as, let's see, what does this say? Does it cut over there in October 2000, Marcia and Mary? Oh, I guess it kept going down. Uh, friends and family. Yeah, there's the wake. And then uh, Marcioni was buried Friday in Edgel Grove Cemetery. Born in Waltham, Marcioni moved to uh, Framingham when she was four, attended St. Bridget's School, and graduated from Framingham's North High School in 1978. She married Case two years later and worked as a medical secretary. In 1986, newspaper clippings. Uh, laminated by her mother shows a beaming and pregnant Marcioni with b uh, bushy hairdo holding a kitten she had rescued and placed in her fledgling animal shelter at the 14 Nelson Street house. So her home was the animal shelter. <laughs> uh, Case and Marcioni separated in 1990 but remained on good terms according to family members. Wait, what happened? So there's a guy named, is Case the, who's Case? She married Case. Oh, that was a different person, right? Uh, 
Yeah, so Stephen Henderson's the one that she married in uh, October 2000. So who's who's this case guy? The last couple of years, she really turned the corner. Oh, that must have been her first husband. Okay. All right, so Case and Marcioni separated in 1990 but remained on good terms, according to family members. She was a fighter, and she appeared to be winning, Case said, referring to his wife's history of addiction. More than anything, she loved her daughter. You know, it makes you wonder, was there an insurance policy on her? And then he had, he from jail, had somebody go out and kill her. Although... When somebody would go kill her, they wouldn't be so have so much rage in them to stab her in the face and neck over and over and over again. So unless I was intentionally done to make it look like it was somebody that knew her, but I don't know. Uh, so this is like a week later. Uh, no arrests have been made in the brutal stabbing death of Framingham resident Karen Marcioni on October 8th. Framingham and state police have continued to work around the clock to reconstruct the murder, said Anson K., spokesman for Middlesex District Attorney Martha Coakley. They are working awfully hard on the case. Marcioni died two hours after police responded to a call made just before 11 a.m. from her Nelson Street home. The district attorney's office, which is handling the homicide investigation in conjunction with Framingham police and state police have released no details about the case. All right. And then there was almost nothing in the paper for a long time. And now it's just, you know, on the internet. 2016. I'm sure it was even in there back then, too. But. 10 years old. You pushed by a local woman to find the killer who took her mother away from her when she was just 14 years old. The Framingham woman was stabbed to death inside her own home just weeks after the September 11th attacks. 15 years later, it's still a murder mystery. Fox 25's Ted Daniel is live in Framingham after speaking with the woman's daughter, who's hoping to get closure. Ted? Mark Vanessa, the murder happened in October 2001. As you know, it was a very tense time in the U.S. just weeks after 9-11. At the outset, the family says they were under the impression that investigators had made significant progress and had developed leads and possible suspects. But nothing ever came of that. And tonight, they are asking for a second look. I'm not sure their motive, but no, I don't think it was random at all. Jennifer Case was a freshman in high school when her mother was murdered. Now 29, she's still waiting to hear what investigators may know about what happened. The month October, the year 2001. Late in the morning on Columbus Day, Karen Marshy. That's it, right? Day, Karen Marshy. It still looks like that. Right? Yeah. That was about like that. The year 2001. <coughs> Late in the morning on Columbus Day, Karen Marciani dialed 911 from her Nelson Street apartment. When Framingham police arrived... I wonder if she got any words off. Or was it just that they know that she dialed... Five, ...they found her on the floor in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds to the face and neck. Investigators collected evidence at the scene and conducted numerous interviews. At least one person of interest was developed, but no arrest have been made. This is referred to as a cold case, but the way I see it, it's always been a cold case. Jennifer's father, Karen's first husband, Stephen Case, says he doesn't know why she was targeted, but based on a conversation he had with her just days before the murder, he knew she was afraid. I could see it in her face that she was nervous about something. Wasn't really sure what it was. Uh, and then she did tell me that the person who lived upstairs from her uh, saw some people in the backyard, three people. It's a mystery that haunts the family, and their commitment to seek justice is getting stronger by the day. I have a lot more hope now than I did a year ago or even a month ago. Um, the response that I'm getting from this makes me really hopeful. 
The Middlesex DA's office released this statement to Fox 25. It reads, after 15 years, our office remains committed to solving the murder of Karen Marciani and bringing closure to the victim's family and loved ones. While we have made progress, this remains an open investigation. The DA's office is also asking anyone who might have information to come forward. Reporting live in Framingham tonight, I'm Ted Daniel, Fox 25 News. I uh, saw some people in the backyard, three people. It knew she was afraid. But I could see it in her face that she was nervous about something. Wasn't really sure what it was. Uh, and then she did tell me that the person who lived upstairs from her uh, saw some people in the backyard, three people. It's a mystery hmm. that haunts the family okay. and their commitment to seek justice is getting backyard, stronger man. by the day. I have a lot more hope now than I did a year ago or even a month ago. Um, the response that I'm getting from this makes me really hopeful. The Middlesex DA's office released this statement to Fox 25. It reads, after 15 years, our office remains committed to solving the murder of this Karen Marciani and bringing closure to the victim's family and loved ones. While we have made progress, this remains an open investigation. The DA's office... I don't know. What does the pet rescue have to do with anything? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. Did she? Uh, almost 15 years later, brutal murder of... Framingham Karen Marcioni remains unsolved. Uh, let's see. Jennifer Case walked up to her mother and handed her some flowers. The gift from then 14-year-old girl was in celebration of Karen Marcioni's 41st birthday. It was the last time Case... Uh... Okay, hold on a second. Hey, thanks, Freebird Forever. By the way, tomorrow I'm gonna, uh, you know, tomorrow's donation night, but I'm gonna do. Uh... Man, there's just a couple of these crazy cases out there. Jeez, I couldn't believe it. And one of them I'd never even heard of. It sounds like a serial killer. Uh, you know, serial killer that that never really got punished for it. He was just sort of. Uh... Well, how about this? If I told you. That one man had three girlfriends that all went missing and never to be found again. Would you think that uh, that it was just coincidence? I mean, let me ask you this: put a one if you actually know somebody that's missing. I mean, it's not like I don't know anybody that's missing, and I don't know anybody that knows anybody that's missing. But you might know personally, like a friend of yours that's missing. Do, you, do, do any of you have a boyfriend that's missing or a girlfriend that's missing that you dated at one time? And I guess I bet the answer to that is like most people would say no. Of course, people know, you know, might have a family member that went, you know. But I'm talking about and then to say that you had three. Uh, I knew Brenda would say, yeah. So then then there's like three um, boyfriends. I mean, imagine if you had three boyfriends and they all went missing. I, if I was a cop, so I'd be knocking on your door. Yeah, everyone always, yeah, I know. People. I want to know if one of your boyfriends is missing, not somebody, just some random person that you know. Okay. Is there anybody out here that has a significant other that's missing right now? <laughs> okay, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, so a cousin and all right. Right, so imagine, Brenda, Susanna, if it was your boyfriend, you had three boyfriends that were, they'd all gone missing. Uh, I gotta tell you, you'd be the first one I'd come looking at, all right? So that's one of the stories for tomorrow. It's unreal, unreal. <laughs> All right, okay. I mean, there are people out there, you know, that people know people that are missing. That's why I switched it up. So that's the girl that we were just seeing many years later, <laughs> about 20 years later, I guess.
Oh, and thank you to uh, Susan Tonarelli. Is that address correct on there, Susan? For your, because um, I'll send you a um, a notebook. Yeah. Well, why don't you send me some stuff on that, Brenda? Yeah. If you've got a cousin that's missing, why don't you post it in uh, Zozo and Sarita, their Facebook group, the, uh, what is it called? GHI, the Missing Network. You should post about it in there. Okay, that's, that's accurate. Okay. Cool. All right, you're the only one in this next batch. If you too, look at this, you guys. I'm using the notebook. I'm studying to get my Part 107 drone license so that I can actually use footage because I, I take it seriously. Like, I don't really, I mean, I've rarely used it on here. But look at, look, I'm taking the notes on here, see? <laughs> this one is Part 107, the uh, notebook number one. All right, so there it is. And that's on PayPal. If you send, do 25, you get the notebook and you're into the spin too. So you could win twice. So especially tomorrow, I mean, tomorrow's donation night. If you want to do that, uh, you know, that'd be great. I can send out a ton of notebooks. I just sit there and I actually write something in them, you know, write a little note, <laughs> you know, if I know you better, it might be longer, you know, some people I don't know that well or whatever, but. I write something. I gotta figure out a cheaper way to do it though. Cause I'd like to be able to send it to Australia and you know, the Netherlands, you know, I sent it, I've sent two so far to the Netherlands cause they won, or I mean they sent it in, but one of them sent like 50 bucks to cover it cause, uh, which was more than generous cause it's like cost me 20, but it's still, you know, it's. If you sent 25 and it goes to the Netherlands, it's five dollars, you know, probably the bulk cost for all the notebooks and then the the packaging and all that. So you actually lose money sending it to there. It's crazy, but in the United States, it's like cost five dollars. So I guess the overall, you know, it's like ten or eleven or something. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out a way to. Uh, plus, I'm going to do other things. Maybe get stickers, or you know, people wanted to have the. Uh, I don't know bumper sticker for a car, and then maybe. I don't know what was the one. The okay, what the what the hell is this T-shirt? <laughs> that would be pretty cool, actually. I like that. Welcome, Sabrina Hennessy, to Freaks 101. Man, it's about time to go back over uh, and go through all the emojis again. All right, so back to this. So she was stabbed in the face and neck a whole bunch of times. Uh, she had a really abusive ex-husband. Uh, I'm not sure if they got divorced or not but uh, he was in jail at the time so it says it was the last time okay so it was her 41st birthday two days after a family birthday party Marcioni was savagely stabbed to death inside her home on October 8 2001 the case will reach a grim milestone once the calendar hits October 8 2016 the date that marks the 15 year anniversary of the murder. I just remember I gave her flowers, said Case, now 29. That must be the daughter. I'm always grateful that was my last encounter with her, smiling on her birthday. It was the last time I saw her. You know, I, I would actually recommend, I would recommend that you, uh, hold on a second. Hey, thank you. Dana Dane.
the artist. <laughs> All right, get that in there. Thank you. Hmm. So I'm always grateful that was. Yeah, I would recommend if you have somebody that passes away in less than you know, like in a car accident, you know, some just don't go see the person. I mean, uh, I would just try to remember what you remember them looking like. You know, you don't want to see them because that, that sort of sticks with you for a while. What they look like after they were dead. And it's kind of like, is that was how productive was that? Now, I could see if it was your child and they weren't mangled or anything. They died of something and maybe seeing them, seeing them that last time or something. But like if it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't even... You, know, you do whatever the hell you want. It's just, uh, I just, that's the last time when I saw my brother, he, he didn't look mangled or anything. He was dead, but it seems like I remember that a lot instead of like all the goofy, you know, when he was funny and stuff like that. So that's what I would recommend, but, uh, you know, everybody has their own thing. Like I'm not a big open casket person. I I don't even understand it, to be honest with you. Like lying in repose, you know. <clears throat> I mean, by the way, would you, when when you die, or uh, would you want people? I mean, knowing that you're not alive and they're still walking by, looking at you. <laughs> I don't know. That'd be strange. Oh, she does the, like, you pour the paint and swirl it around and stuff. Where the hell is the, uh, let me see if I can find the, well, she did the one on the upper left there. That was, like, two, but, man, there was a really cool one. I think it's on my other computer. It looks like a planet or something. Do I have it on, I don't even remember where I put it, but. Got a whole new computer, so everything's kind of whacked out. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, she locked. Wow, this is crazy. I didn't see this. Mar Marcioni called 911 around 11:10 a.m. So you know that's crazy. That's right in the middle of the day, right? Like 11:10 a.m. on the day of the killing. And said she had just been attacked inside her 14th. So she doesn't even know this person. Obviously. I mean, even if her husband set it up, they, she wouldn't know the person. Emergency responders found Marcioni with multiple stab wounds in the face, neck, and chest. So this person just went absolutely berserk, totally personal attack. Uh, she locked herself in the bathroom and she said, I've been stabbed. So she was still alive. And she got in the bathroom, locked herself in. Wow. They came right away, case recall. She was airlifted to UMass in Worcester, and she died two hours later. Oh, man. Brutal. Questions about who killed her mother and what prompted such a brutal attack remain in Case's mind. At first, the news about her mother's death was surreal, but Case, who still lives in town, remained steadfast and wanting answers. Um, I know if the situation were reversed, she would be here fighting for me, said Case, who was Marcioni's only child. Marcioni was divorced from her first husband, and on the way to getting another divorce from her second husband, who was in jail at the time of the murder. Case said her mother struggled with hard drug use and alcohol abuse and went to rehab several times. Marcioni had also been in an abusive relationship after her first marriage. Case said her mother showed up at the home of her ex-husband, uh, Case's father, days before her killing and talked about being afraid to go home. Case said her mother showed up at her at the home of her ex-husband. So Case's father and said, uh, you know, like her, pre her first husband, she went to his home and said, wow, I'm scared to go home. It's more important that I feel the authorities care and I feel that they are not, they are not, let's see. It's more important that I feel the authorities care and I feel that they are not 
trying. Huh. I just wonder if they didn't try because she had substance abuse issues, Case said. She was a great person and a great mother. Well, it sounds like she turned it all around, so. In the summer of July 2005, about four years later, the Metro West Daily News quoted a Framingham police lieutenant who identified, him, uh, uh, who identified a suspect in the killing. The police official said the suspect was Aaron Sutton, who had just been arrested on charges of trying to kill his girlfriend, the newspaper reported. Okay, but did he know her? Framingham police did not return a call for comment on the case. The Middlesex County District Attorney's Office sent a statement about Marcioni's death but did not respond to a reporter's question about the suspect. Let's, uh, we're going to go ahead and just look up a few things here. That's probably not a completely unknown name. Yeah. Was it year they said that was? 2004? I don't remember. <clears throat> hmm. It's not in there. Now let me try one more thing. Wait, what? Nah, I think I might have switched towns. What? Where is this one? Yeah, Massachusetts, right. Okay, this is in uh, Framingham. Let's see. I just want to look up this guy. Now it does say Worcester, Massachusetts. And what, what would he be about? I don't know how old he'd be. Let's see what happens. He'd be 50. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. And how old did they say he was here? Aaron Sutton. The police official said the suspect was Aaron Sutton. Okay. And where did he live? Did he ever live right there? Yeah, Framingham. Wow. Well, this is 2000. Let's, let me go back as far as I can. He did live in Framingham, this guy. It doesn't have any, like, old addresses, though. But he has two in, uh, one in Worcester, and three in Framingham, same town. I just want to see in general where like one of these is. So there's one of them. There's Karen. Oh, you can't see shit. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the. Uh, so there's one of them right there, and that, that's where his apartment is now. But that, I mean, this is years ago. And then he also lived in that one at one point. But that's 2021. Now let me check his, uh, the criminal situation. Okay, yeah. Doesn't say what what the criminal record is. So, don't have that information in there.
After 15 years, our office remains committed. Kay still wonders if enough was done. She hasn't heard from investigators in a while and believes police should be talking to her again. Since her mother's death, Case has heard that more than one person might have been in her, in her mother's home during the killing. Well, that might be those three people they were talking about. 100% think they went there with a purpose, Case said. I don't know if it was planned to get that back. Investigators are still holding the jewelry worn by Marcioni at the time of her murder as evidence, Case said. Her mother wore fake nails and some of those were taken too. Well, maybe they have DNA. The brutal stabbing took from Case and her family a mother, animal lover, and woman with a big heart. Case said the filing of the killing left her without a mother at an important time in a 14-year-old girl's life. Now, that definitely is a crucial age. It was hard not having someone to talk to about boys and relationships. I think it was kind of hard for my dad to play those to play both roles. She was a huge animal rights person, an animal lover. She had a million cats. She volunteered with the elderly and sat with them and did their nails. Project Cold Case, an organization that focuses on information about unsolved cases, recently highlighted Marcioni's death in an online post that has been shared across social media. Uh, Case hopes the attention will bring more details to light. I haven't given up hope, Case said. Hmm, that's what a nightmare. Jeez. Now those are 2016 articles. So let's see. This one is 2018. Karen Marcioni's 41st birthday was a happy on one. WCVD. We had dinner at my nana's house, and the whole family came over. I gave her flowers, kissed her goodbye, said I love you. Isn't that weird? That's actually her, that little, the little girl that's in those pictures. Jennifer Case treasures that memory. It's the last time she saw her mother alive. I was 14, and I had just started high school one month prior. Two days later, Karen Marcioni was murdered. Karen Marcioni called 911 from her home here on Nelson Street in Framingham. She told the dispatcher she had been stabbed and police found her. Yeah, we had a live show and uh, Dana Dane comes on and, you know, two Halloweens she's come on and painted something. Uh, the last one is like a, a planet. And I scanned it in, so I'm not sure where it is right now. Or I took a picture of it. I mean. Clinging to life. When police arrived, they were able to see that she was in the bathroom I, I the of her image, apartment, the um, that is. she'd been stabbed up against the door, and a couple of hours later was pronounced dead. The reports say that she was stabbed multiple times, I believe over 30, in her face, head, neck, and chest. When she died, she was getting ready to go to church, so she had all her jewelry on. That jewelry was recently returned to her daughter. So this is just her watch. Mm. It actually still has some blood on it. So that's horrifying. That still has her hair in it. How could it still have blood on it? Case Maybe that blood that was there is the, the killer's blood. You ever thought of that? Admits her mother had struggled with substance abuse and wonders if that's a factor in the crime remaining unsolved for 17 years. My message to the DA is that my mom was an amazing person. She wasn't just a drug addict. Whatever negative conception that they've decided about her, which is very apparent when we have our meetings, I was even told that she had a poor lifestyle, like by law enforcement. So fine, none of that matters though. She's still dead and she died in a really horrible way. Yeah. There's been no See, arrest. That, no. That's right. See, that's what you get, man. When, when, you know, the sex workers or people who do drugs are always marginalized. Like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they deserved it. You know, just forget it. And it's just garbage, you know, because the thing is, is serial killers, 
prey on those people because they know that law enforcement has an attitude, not all of them, but, you know, in overall there's a bias, okay? I mean, if, if you argue against that, you're just, there's something wrong with you. It's just true, you know? They, the cases are put on a lower tier of importance. No one's even gone to court. So either you're hiding something or like you're not doing anything. So please figure it out. We're actually in the process of doing some forensic testing on this case. So, you know, we are as so seems really concerned about to getting to a resolution to being able to make an assessment of who was responsible for Karen's death. Her case has never been forgotten by this office. Her only comfort cards and letters sent by her mother. You are a very special girl and mean more to me than anyone. I love you and need you to know and feel that love. All my love, Mom. And obviously as difficult as it is to talk mm -hmm. about her mother's murder, Jennifer is very hopeful that by shining a spotlight on it, bringing it back into the public eye, perhaps some new information will come forward. And the Middlesex County District Attorney urges anyone with any information to please come forward as well. And obviously for all the cases we profiled tonight, authorities ask that if you do have information, you do come forward in whatever way you can. And that is Chronicle for tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Anthony Everett. And I'm Shana Seymour. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Yeah. That one, and then 2021, that was 2018. Let's see what this one says now. Come on. Tonight, the family of a Framingham woman brutally murdered in her home wants prosecutors hey, to Hughes. approach the case with new urgency. They claim investigators have done little to track down the killer who has gotten away with murder for nearly 20 years. Our chief investigator, Cheryl Fiandaka, has her story. Watching this precious video brings back the happy memories Jennifer Case has of her mother. It was really sweet to see how she acted with me. You ready? She was just <laughs> such a good mom and she was so caring. Framingham police are investigating a woman's murder. Jennifer was just 14 years old when her mom, Karen Marchione, was stabbed to death in her home. Just like the fear she must have felt. It's really hard. It happened at about 11 a.m. on October 8, 2001. Karen, who struggled with substance abuse, was living here in this house on Nelson Street in Framingham when she was brutally attacked. The 41-year-old mother fought for her life and managed to call 911 for help. She died two hours later at the hospital. These are the jewelry that she was wearing the day that it happened. This was just her ring she was wearing, bracelet, her necklace, which was broken off, her hair still in it, which is just awful. Shortly after the murder, police identified a suspect, but that person was never arrested or charged. Since then, nearly 20 years have passed. It's not hopeful. It's got to have DNA like to in there somewhere. somewhere. Karen's cousin, Christine Rogers Pelletier, says the two grew up together. She visits her grave often just to tell her the family hasn't given up and is angry that the Middlesex District Attorney hasn't done more to catch Karen's killer. They should try harder. As far as we're concerned, they're not because we don't hear from them. Obviously, this is so upsetting because it's my mom, but also it's just so saddening that this can happen to victims and that nothing gets done about it. It's been made pretty clear that they see her as a drug addict or someone lesser than. Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan declined our request for an interview and in a statement said this about Karen's case. Our office remains committed to solving the murder. Yeah. Since the time of her death, we have pursued multiple leads like in forensic answer. testing. Despite these efforts, this case remains uncharged. <laughs> Jennifer still believes someone knows who killed her mother and shared some of the beautiful cards and letters she wrote to her. So this one says, Happy Valentine's Day to the one I love the most. You're a wonderful person, smart, funny, pretty nice, sweet, cool, and totally awesome. I just want people to see her for a mom and the caring, amazing person that she was. 
and that this is not okay that we don't have answers. Cheryl Fiandaka, WBZ News. We hope she gets those answers. Have you seen something the I team should be looking into? You can send us an email, I team at cbsboston.com, or you can just call us 617 779 TIPS. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I should get a hold of her, the, the daughter, see if she wants to come on, maybe go over it a little bit. Give her a place to. You know, vent for a while or whatever, you know, whatever she wants to do. But uh, yeah, this is our last day before donation night tomorrow, guys. If you guys like to help out the channel, get in on the spin at the end of the show for the notebook, or if you send on PayPal, the 25, you get a notebook as well, as well as being in the spin. That'd be great. Uh, I know we're in different times now. I, I'm having a hard time accepting it because, <laughs> man, we were always just rocking and rolling, man. But, uh, you know, I'm going to have to adjust what I'm doing, too, you know, so I guess I won't be able to donate as much. So there you go. All right. But tomorrow's their big night. Let's see how that goes. Hey, thanks, Lillian. You put the, you don't have the right name on there again, but <laughs> All right, got it in there. Hmm. Yeah, doesn't it just seem like that's one that should just be solved? Because there, there's only a few people. It's somebody that she knew, right? I mean, serial killers. You know, sometimes kill like that, but at the same time, this sounds like it's really personal. They just came in and they just hated her, you know, really hated her, stabbed her in the face, stabbed her in the neck, in the chest. You know, nothing lower torso, just absolutely went nuts on her. Thank you, Lillian. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I got I got work to follow up work to do on these ones. Crazy. Although I was thinking of just covering Dylan rounds for the next six weeks straight, playing the same videos over and over again. What do you guys think of that? Well, he mentioned the suspect a little bit ago. Well, one of them, Sutton. They said in two thousand and four that was who their suspect was, but. I don't know. All right, now let's go to the Linda Reyes Geddes case. G E D D E S. All right, so we're going to go back in time. This is in Utah uh, where a body is found. Okay, so law enforcement in Garfield and Wayne counties are trying to identify a murdered woman whose mutilated body was found in a sleeping bag south of Hanksville so you know I've been I feel like I'm close to the spot here so I put a pin yeah you know, where it seemed like it could be where the body was found and let me put this so that's 276 and 95 coming down and it's really beautiful out here. I mean, look at look at what it looks like. Just even on Google Earth, the crappy. I mean, look look at this, man. That's why we do our flybys in Utah all the time. You know, I was looking at that mountain there that looked similar to one of the something that was in a picture. Hey, Nick, thanks. Get that in there for the spin. But, but I don't think that is but uh, that little image back there that outcropping looks similar to something but I don't think that's it in fact I don't have I never could find what I saw in one of these photographs so we'll get to that in a little bit but let's just read through this so this is a Jane Doe from 20 years so it was law 
Officers in Garfield and Wayne County are trying to identify a murdered woman whose mutilated body was found in a sleeping bag south of Hanksville at milepost number six. Now, that'd be great if you knew what the hell milepost, what road milepost number six was. But I think now that we might know in another article that's on Highway 276, but it doesn't really say that here. It says, a sleeping bag south of Hanksville at mile post number six, a place known as Maiden Water. The site is crossed by State Highway 276. Okay, so so that's 276. But uh, but Maiden, hold on, Maiden. What do they call that? Maiden something or yeah, Maiden Water. I mean it's way down here, so. I guess maybe we can put a pin here and sort of say Maiden Water. And then later on, we'll try to, we'll spend the end of the show trying to figure out exactly where the crime scene was, okay? So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of miles there. There's Hanksville up here. I put here because it said 276 crosses there, but then Maiden Water's down here. So how do we really know? <laughs> I mean, what in the hell they're talking about? Okay. So a place known as Maiden Water. Uh, the site is crossed by State Highway 276 to Tigaboo, uh, Tigaboo, Bullfrog, and Lake Powell. The body was discovered April 20th by a couple hiking in the area. Investigators say they are unsure how long the body had been in the area. And there are currently no suspects. The initial examination by the state examiner showed that the woman was shot execution style in the back of the head and duct tape was found around her head, hands, and waist. After death, the woman's fingers were cut off. Well, I mean, look how this is crazy, right? So she was shot in the back of the head execution style. She was found, um, it was around her head, hands, and waist. After death, so after she died, the woman's fingers were cut off with a sharp instrument. So they didn't want her identified. The body had apparently frozen at some point with Hanksville temperatures reported at 30 degrees. So it sounds like maybe she was in preserved pretty well. Investigators are seeking help from anyone who may be able to identify the woman. They believe she was approximately 40 years old with brown hair and eyes and weighed about 140 pounds. Anyone with information may call the Garfield County Sheriff's Office. But apparently that, that was way back then. Then in 2001, there was a, uh, let's see, let me rename this. You know what's cool? You, you guys ever seen those WEBP files that are on the web for images? I just, one day I just said, you know what? Because they don't open up naturally if you click on them after you've downloaded them. But if you just change the extension on them to JPEG, they just open up. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. Like, there it is. See, it didn't even... It wasn't like this weird conversion thing. All right, so press release. Please check the, the Utah something app website for the newest addition to the unidentified body section. Today, January 29, 2001, so that body was found in 1998, Garfield County Jane Doe was added to the unidentified body section. On April 20, 1998, a body of an unidentified female was found on the side of Utah State Road 276. So now we know it's on 276. The body was found approximately 36 miles north of Bullfrog Lake. Oh, let me, let me get uh, Bullfrog Lake in there. Okay. Well, where's the lake? Ah, oh, jeez. It's never just, uh, I have frong, bullfrong lake. <laughs> yeah. But maybe that's this lake then, I guess? All right, we'll just call this uh, bullfrog. Let's put a town right here. 
Bullfrog. Wait. Okay, there he did that one. We we're looking at the press release. Uh, it was covered with plastic bags wrapped in duct tape, wrapped in a rug, which had a design of houses and roadways for children to play on. They've been uh, tied up. The victim is believed to be either Hispanic or Native American, aged 37 to 45, 5'3, 112 pounds, dark brown, wavy shoulder length hair, eyes are brown. She had the following identification personal features, multiple dental restorations, facial freckles, tattooed eyebrows, small dark mole on the right ear towards the top, small dark mole on the upper lip and on the chin, and a small dark mole on the left shoulder. All right, then in 2018, so that just went like nobody was coming up with anything. And so then 2018, uh, which is weird, this article here, that's actually, I, I believe, a picture of the her when they found her, I think. I mean, it seems to be how they're describing it. Yeah, an unidentified woman in her 30s or 40s left, which they believe might be the handiwork of this serial killer right here. All right, so it says, investigators believe that a serial killer who pleaded guilty to killing four people may be responsible for as many as 21 additional. The latest case to be tied to the Colorado serial killer, Scott Kimball, who dubbed himself Hannibal Lecter, is in Utah where authorities re are reviving a 1998 cold case homicide. According to search warrant filed in Logan County, Colorado in December 2017, Kimball told Colorado investigators that he killed 21 people, one of them being a hitchhiker. Citing that confession and other evidence, investigators said on Tuesday that Kimball, who is currently serving 70 years in prison after pleading guilty to second-degree murder charges, is the only person of interest in 1998 slay of unidentified woman known only as Maiden Water Victim. So that's how they should, they should put stuff like this out, because that's them, although... To be honest with you, it doesn't really look like... Well, so here are the images they have here. And it looks like they've got the vehicles parked here. And then she was probably found right down in there. And um, that's what we're going to go spend time at the end of the show trying to figure out where the hell that is, all right? All right, so according to a 2001 press release from Utah Attorney General's office on April 20th, 1998, a woman body was found on the side of Utah State Road 276 so it is on 276 about 36 miles north of Lake Powell the victim was described as being 37 to 45 the victim had freckles tattooed eyebrows extensive dental work and multiple small dark moles she was covered with plastic bags wrapped in duct tape tied with a rope and placed inside a sleeping bag before being wrapped in carpet investigators have been able to determine that Kimball was in southern Utah around the time um, the Jane Doe murder occurred. Hey, thank you very much, free bird forever. According to SBI report from last year, the August 2017 Davis and another agent traveled to Sterling Correctional Facility in Colorado to interview Kimball about the 1998 cold case. So this guy is a, you know, he's a serial killer, this guy right here. I'm, I was trying to figure out, are these his victims or confirmed victims? These three women right here. All right. So that was in October of 2018. And then just two months later. So that's actually her right there, which it just, it, I mean, I guess that kind of shows you that even when you have a an image of somebody dead it doesn't really look like her you know oh and that's interesting because there's the mole that they were talking about right inside there oops uh, so it says lena reyes gatis was a woman found murdered in 1998 near maiden water spring in garfield county utah 
She was identified in November of 2018. Reyes Geddes was last seen in Austintown, Ohio on April 8th, 1998. And yeah, so her body's found May 7th, so that's the maximum of a month. She was supposed to travel to Dallas, Texas, and then to Laredo, Texas, but it's not apparent if she ever made it to those destinations. Six months later, on October 14th, her husband reported her missing to the Youngstown, Ohio Police Department. That's a red flag, right? I mean, six months later, really? Lena's body was discovered on April 20th in Garfield County, Utah. It had been covered with plastic bags wrapped in duct tape, tied with a rope, and placed inside a sleeping bag before being wrapped in a rug. She had been shot in the head and her fingers had been cut off, preventing identification. Serial killer Scott Kimball was considered a suspect in her murder as the way she was found is similar to the way many of his victims were found. In June 2022, it was announced that her husband, Edward Geddes, had been identified as her killer. So that's today. I mean, like right now. Geddes had taken his own life in Nevada in 2001. All right, so we got, there's that one, and then these are the articles from uh, today. I mean, they must have just updated that page today, but I mean, here's the... Here's New Technology and Persistence by Youngstown, Austintown, and Utah law enforcement helped solve a mystery that lasted 24 years. The information is not what the family wanted to hear, but they're thankful wow, for answers like on her. the murder of their loved one. I mean, I guess Janet it kind Rogers of has information about what led to solving this crime two decades later. Lena reyes Getty's family finally has answers on what happened to their beloved, who seemingly vanished from Austin Town in 1998, just two years after she married Edward Geddes. It took decades and tenacity on trails that kept... Yeah, it's hard to, you know, that's hard to do that. It seems like you could make her up, though, like have a mortician make her up like she looks like a regular person. But I don't know, that might be tough. But you can tell that's her, the nose shape and everything. Going cold. Now, these cases are very difficult to work going back this long. Identifying Lena's body took 20 years. Whoever left a body off Highway 276 in Utah had wrapped the 37-year-old in a carpet in a sleeping bag after tying her up, shooting her in the head and cutting off fingertips to make it difficult to identify her. But by fate or coincidence, on the same day that Youngstown Detective David Sweeney entered her picture into a national missing persons database called NamUs, Utah State Bureau of Investigation agent Brian Davis had entered a picture of the woman who had been murdered into the... Yeah, and it was actually an inter internet sleuth who uh, saw the mole description on the update, you know, the uploaded person and compared to a missing person upload. The same database. A woman with a keen eye in California made a connection. There you go. She spotted it quickly, the, the mole in the ear, and said that we should probably consult with each other on the case, and it, it turned. DNA <laughs> left on a rope would eventually awesome. unravel the mystery by Utah Bureau of Good Investigation, job, which kept trying newer DNA tests, even paying private labs after the development of newer technologies and analytical software. The agent says, finally, technology MVAC and the use of DNA by Getty's relatives led to the killer. If Edward Getty's were still alive, we would, we would pursue, you know, pursue charges of homicide in connection to her death. Edward Geddes died by suicide in 2001. Lena's family thankful they finally have answers. With more local news, I'm Janet Rogers. Yeah, so we got that one. And then, let's see. Another, I think, is that the same Here's one? Here's new technology. Seems kind of, I think that's the same one. So I actually have, let me, let's keep this one open, close that one down. And then, uh, let's see. Let 
Yeah, so I found him, you know, the, the guy, he's on Ben Verified here. He killed himself in 2001. He was much older than she was. I mean, he was 66 years old. You can tell that in the picture they have together. And it looks like they lived in... Yeah, various, a whole bunch of different places in this town here. So he lived in all these homes in 86. And she went missing in 98. So it could be that one. You know, this house, right? He, he kind of lived in apartments, though. It's weird. You know, like in 86, he lived in these apartments. And I wonder how they met, you know. And then apparently this is maybe where he worked or actually I think he this address right here he's associated with if you go down there I'm not sure you can even see it but it's 316 which apparently is this one so he lived in that one and then you know he probably killed himself knowing the writing was on the wall there you know it's like her body's found and then three years later he What's, well, it's interesting because he kills himself in, uh, where the hell was that? Yeah, in Nevada, which is closer to Utah, right? So it's like, what was he doing over there? Was he kind of wanting to be near where he killed his wife, I guess? It's pretty strange. All right, let's try to find this spot now, okay? That'll be our last thing for the night. So there's 276, and they said mile marker six. So I'm kind of wondering if it, well, they said 36 miles from here. So if you were right here, and I guess, you know, we can just do it like kind of a slow way here. Uh, that's not going to be too slow because that's already three miles. All right. And now we're at 5.75. Bing, 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 bing. And now we're at 13. They said 36, right? And this is how they measure it. They drive it. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they, as a crow flies, you know. All right, we're at 26. Ah, oh, see, we're getting up to near Maiden Water here. All right, 28.8. Thirty-one point eight, thirty-three. Okay, we're getting kind of in the area where I was thinking it was. Thirty-four, thirty-six. That's right on the thirty-six mile mark. Four. And now if we go down there, it should be somewhere around in this area here. And when you look at the picture here, I think I even looked at this before. It's weird. I'm going to open this up though, the, uh, the Daily Mail one. So when you open this up here, you see how the road is curving and then straightens out and then goes way down there. And then starts going to the right. Now, are we looking at this on, you know, on the, you know, I don't know what direction we're heading, I guess is what I'm saying here. It doesn't matter what, you know, what side is it, north or south or, all right. So you look at that and then you go back down to here. And so something that might look like that would be right here. 
Except I don't see any mountains sitting around, so I'll go down to Street View here. And so that doesn't look the same at all. But we're right in the area now. If you turn around, I don't see that over here either. And those definitely would still be there. Those, I mean, those are plateaus. So I guess what we could do, they said mile marker six. So why don't we just go down here and look around and hopefully we can read a mile marker if we get on, get on one. First I'll turn around to see if there wasn't one right behind me when I... <laughs> Yeah, don't be old. Use Discord. Uh, it's going to be hard to read that if it's that blurry right there. This is 2008 Street View here. I just want to find this spot. Oh, gee, thanks, Gray. Well, I don't even know what that means. Huh, I wonder about that plateau that's right there. Could that be it? And from the other side? Yeah, so now we're all the way back here. So I already saw that. Hmm. Now that kind of... God, is it back here maybe? A little bit more? Just straight around, right off this curve? Is that the, Yeah, that curve is the right direction. So what if it's like right here on this turn? Hmm. No, it can't be it. See the uh, that image right there on the bottom has that plateau, and it doesn't really fit right there. It seems like it's more right at the top, right right as you. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit further. No, that can't be it either. So what if it's the other way around, like this, on that angle? Yeah, that's not even close. Hmm. So then that 36 mile thing, maybe it's... Uh, Where's the road turning though? So what if it's this side, I guess, or here? Right on that? But that doesn't even look like there's a plateau anywhere around on the left. Yeah, see, there's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's been really, uh, it was a really hard one for me. I mean, I got 36 miles right from the lake, basically. Yeah, maybe it's back a mile or so. Let's see. Right here. We go right to the lake. What's going on, Pebs? Amistay. What about that thing? Does that work?
That's too far onto the road. How's your mom doing, Pebs? She's still kicking ass out at the uh, the hospital. Man, this should be so easy. Because this is on the highway they're talking about. And here's where it starts. It's definitely not over here. Maybe we can try to find the plateau just by using the 3D Google Earth stuff. Yeah. I mean, you guys can see that, right? This little, this thing right here. Now, all we needed was like one mountain in the background that would have been perfect. I was thinking it was a nursing home. Couldn't think of the phrase when I said it, though. Basically, I just need to fi find one mile marker. Does anybody live in Utah? Do they actually have the numbers on them? Maybe there's one right there. Just go down a little bit further. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Lily. Yeah, I'm just looking for it. You don't have to. Look at that, 349 for gas. All right. Man, those are the good old days, huh? Look at that, it's almost like, uh, look at the clouds zooming by there. Time lapse almost, it's pretty cool. Oh wait, right there, what about that? That looks pretty good right there. Hold on, let me move it forward here. I think I might have just found it. It's look, it looks good, but it might not be. Who knows? Where was it? I gotta go back. Oh wait, was that it right there? Huh. Yeah, then that's off the road about the right amount. I don't see the curve. Okay, so let me just. God, is it right there? On this turn? Maybe? Well, let's, let me go back. Let me go to right here. Oh yeah, I mean that that's looking pretty good. And it's going the other direction maybe. Let's see. Come on, keep going. And here here maybe that's uh, I don't know. It's too sharp. Right here. Oh, I don't know. God, it's crazy. I was looking pretty good for a minute there, but let me see what happens when I go around this turn here. Yeah, well, apparently mile marker six, but I haven't even seen one mile marker.
And that doesn't seem like it it's the right one there either. God, that looks so good from back there. See, there's maiden water, so, and then we got it all the way here, so it's got to be in this area right here. Like right in that section. Alright, so no doubt about it. There's maiden water. We've got a, a turn on a road. And does it make it doesn't do that turn? It does kind of turn like that, but I don't see the creek or anything, or whatever that is down there, the arroyo or whatever. It's not there, so that's not the right spot. So there's maiden water area. What about right there? I mean, geology doesn't change that much. So it should look almost identical. Not even moving right there. Yeah, see, it doesn't look like that either. I know you guys are, are you guys bored stiff or just hang out and talk you guys. If we find it, I'll say something. <laughs> Ooh, I could maybe see this being it right here. Just the way things are looking. Right there, come on. Come around this turn, and that's exactly, and that should be a straightaway, and... I see a plateau right there that looks more like how I'm thinking it. And it's, oh yeah, and then we got, okay, so there's the turn. So just on right here and it looks just like how you would think it was and maybe she would yeah I think this is it here the reason I I mean this I mean it's, it could be the way it's zoomed in but uh, see how the road curves and then it goes straight and it kind of goes up and then it starts to turn way in the background over there and that's exactly what it does here. See how it, it turned right back there. Let me, let me go back a little bit. So it can't be those rocks have nothing to do with it. I think that might be the plateau over here. Let me just take a look at it. Now whatever that is, that mound, that right back in the distance there. It's right in the right area too. So this this thing right here. Oh, I can't see it. I well, can kind of see part of it right there. But. Yeah, so it's on a rise. I think that's I think that's it. Because it matches everything. It's near the maiden water area. It's pretty close to 
uh, you know, the end of the 36 miles that we came up with. And it was right, was it right here? Ah, oh, shoot. Oh, there goes the cutout a little bit. Yep. Yeah, I think it's just, I think that's it right here. And here's just as it's turning around, so almost like it was right in this area. Does that make sense with the other picture though? Let's see. I don't know, see it looks like there's a mountain, rocks right behind it. Maybe right back here. sort of see that being in the spot back there but you know it's not wide enough to be able to tell I mean it looks like there's rocks and maybe that's what's right back over here but everything else looks pretty good here I'll just put right there And that would probably be, you know, if you, wherever the lake is, add a little bit. So it's close to 36 miles. That'd be like 33. I think it was like a wash that was right there. But if you look at this, and it goes uphill, I think. So, right, that's... Uh, Seven eight eight four. Actually, uh, forty nine seven seven. And then, oh, so that goes downhill there. It's hard to tell when you take a photograph if something's up or down, with nothing else to. Uh, See, that's the spot. Um, let me know what you guys think here. See how the road's curving like this. Then it goes straight and then it starts to sort of veers to the right a little bit. And then there's a plateau, but depending on the type of camera you use, things look further and cl or closer. Looking on this one, it, it's, it goes straight and it curves and then it does the same thing once you get up to about right. Let me get to the straightaway here. Yeah, so that's where I have it right there, right? So here's the straightaway and then it kind of goes like that and then the same thing. It goes straight and up and around and then there's the plateau over there, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm going to keep looking around for a little bit because I'm just, I'm not certain of anything. Well, butter my bread and call it toast. <laughs> we used to have a basketball announcer that would use that one. 
my god, really? Butter my bread and call it toast. Wow. Um, you know, what kid would appreciate that reference? Any? Any at all? Butter <laughs> my bread. Well, no, you got to toast it first. We call it toast, right? I mean, you can't just put butter on a bread and call it toast. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's the closest place I could find that would match. And other than that, I don't know. That's the 36 mile place. You know what's crazy? There's this rock right here. Look how weird this looks right here. I mean, it's just out of nowhere. This massive rock just sitting here. You could almost do a flyby just on the rock. See, this would have been a pretty good one, but it's the wrong direction of the turn. This one good, but there's no bridge in the one I'm looking at, maybe. Well, I guess we could try right here as a chance. Don't see anything, doesn't work, doesn't work. Let's see what happens right when we get to the top here. Oh, that's right, it doesn't let me go anywhere. Yep, and then there's the straightaway, so it would be right here. And yeah, that's nothing. Like that'd be such a simple plateau to see. I mean, that's why I have it right here because it's the only thing that matched at all. And I think that's the one that was in the background too. I don't see this part. Whatever that is right there, is that a big rock? Yeah. That's not it. So you can see that. See how it has. Yeah, it's just this big rock in the front here. I don't know. Yeah, the other one doesn't have the rocks all over. Oh, we're already at three hours. Oh, boy. So, it's supposed to be around Maiden Water here. <clears throat> Seems like it would be. I think this my, that's my best guess is this spot right here. It's the only thing that... It has the road curving, then straight, and then turning. Uh, had a plateau item in the background. Yeah. Let me go to right here. Yeah. 
So, anyways, maybe I'll go look around on my own at some point, but that's it. All right, well, we're just, uh, that's all I can, that's my best guess. Normally we don't guess, we get the exact spot, but this one, uh, you know, there's nothing out here. There's no plateaus or anything. Is that another rock just sitting there? Would have been nice if they had this quality all around, but they didn't. It's like Mars. All right, well, thank you to Kathy Fredmaker, Billy Juliana, The Velvet Army, Ally Cake, Cammie Curry, Billy Juliana again, Adam Nicholson, uh, the sheriff. Uh, well, yeah. So we had Billy Juliana, the mayor, and. Uh, Adam Nicholson, the uh, sheriff, right in a row. That was weird. Jessica Schubach, Brenda R., Ozzy Tricia, Jan Harrell, Freebird Forever, Bell S., Sabrina Hennessy, Freebird Forever, and Pibs W. And then Dana Dane, Donna Scott. Susan, Lillian, and Nick. All right, so we're going to do the, oh, those are all on PayPal. So we're going to do the, uh, the spin now. For a notebook. All right. Wait, how do I get to the names now? <laughs> Weird. Oh, that doesn't count. Hmm. That's oh, weird. Okay, get rid of advanced. Okay. Here we go. Yep. Hey, thanks, you guys. Pretty interesting cases, though, right? Crazy stuff. But uh, in the last case, the husband died in 2001. I think they just uh, looked at it. He didn't report till later. Then he kills himself. And I'm sure they have other information. They should probably put out what else he had.
All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming in here and watching the show tonight and supporting the channel. Maybe hit the like button, leave a comment. Uh, all right. So thank you guys very much. Uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there in a two and a three and a four. And a yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing oh, for right, a while right, now. Hey. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, flag rejecter. I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Hey, it's audio crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector. Freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector. With all respect, y'all, just remember I've a temple fucking checked ya. I have no agenda, I'm no pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. Talk to you later. <laughs> hey, I'm in the so mean jail. <laughs> I'm going to be in here all night long. <laughs> oh, you can tell. Here we go. I want to be in here so mean, so mean, so mean, so mean, so mean. Yeah. All right, you guys. Maybe I'll put the dogs back in here. Blue. I'll put, I'll put blue in jail. Where the hell is that? I don't know what it's called. Ah. Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. Jojo says it best. It's Zozo. You hear that? They they said Jojo. On the uh, the the voice. How come I can't find it? Where is this one? Hold on. I gotta find the. Uh, Thanks, Billy Giuliani. We'll put that one in there for tomorrow. Wait, where is... How come it doesn't show up there? What's the name of this thing? Yeah, Samsung Old. All right, let me go to... I'm just going to... I'm just testing something out here. So I gotta add the scene. It's Samsung old. Oh, there we go. Then I put him back behind or in front of me. Oh, see that? Look at that. <laughs> He's now got blue in prison. That's how it works. All right, there we go. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. The show is over, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, you mean thanks for no apple, Linda Howell? Yeah. Uh, that was a travesty last night. But thanks, Linda Howe, Linda Molden Howe, the cattle mutilations and crop circles. All right. All right. So, anyways, we'll see you guys tomorrow, and be safe out there. <laughs> I'll play the, the ending again. I got thrown in jail though, so we had to come back on. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector.
Public rejecter, I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Fancy Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a spectre with a vector on his pector with all respect. Remember, I have a temple fucking checkcha. I, I have, have no agenda. agenda. I'm I a pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send you on a mission to reveal the true offender. Alright! Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Thanks, right. everybody. Gee! Gosh, Gray, you're so mean. That's what they say. That's what they say. No, Gray, you really are mean. Have you ever seen when you, you're on there and then you, you say those things? What are you even talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Gray. Guy. Okay. Good night, everybody. We'll see you guys tomorrow. And, yep, after the donation night portion, we'll do the, uh, add a couple crazy cases for tomorrow. All right. So thanks, everybody. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. Be safe out there. Huh? It's a house! There's mosquitoes the size of bald eagles in that dead gum swamp. <laughs>